An ancient proverb cautions us, when you drink water, do not forget its source. In a world with few superpowers, only one has existed from earliest recorded history. Though it has just been within the past century that China has emerged from its self-imposed isolation, this nation, possessing the fourth largest landmass of any country and more than 1.4 billion people, has quickly ascended to the heights of military and economic influence. Its cities, already the hubs of industry and commercial shipping, continue to raise their buildings higher and higher into the sky as though they were trying to reach the heavens themselves. This is modern China, a reality that evokes many images. But the danger to any people is that they forget the significance of their past and thus lose themselves. Their history becomes a tourist attraction. Or an entertainment. Even religion loses its meaning when people forget its source. Within the capital city of Beijing, a short walk from China's most visited tourist attraction, the former imperial palace complex known as the Forbidden City, can be found the largest heaven-worshipping structure in the world. What was, for centuries, the most important place of religious activity in China. It is called Tiantan, known in English as the Altar of Heaven. Thousands of tourists from all over China and the rest of the world visit here every year to see its pagodas and to enjoy the park as a place of recreation. But few of its visitors ever come to know the truth behind this place of worship, and why that truth is so vital to every person in China. The center gate has been closed long enough. Join with us now as we uncover the mystery, the sacred meaning of China's altar of heaven. Ask any Chinese person what the first religion of China was, and they will probably tell you Taoism, or Buddhism, or Confucianism, or they may not even have an answer. What do you understand to be the first religion of China? It's the first religion? Since the creation of the People's Republic of China in 1949 under Chairman Mao Zedong, 
the official ideology of mainland China has been communism. And a primary principle of communism is the belief that there is no God. The businessmen come for profit, as well as missionaries come to heal, must say goodbye, as out the Yangtze steams the last of Western influence, and farewell to a century. So religion today has become, for many, a worn-out superstition of the past. Unfortunately, this leaves a spiritual and psychological vacuum that people try to fill with poor substitutes. People's lives often have a void, an emptiness. This empty space wants to be filled. The way to find true satisfaction is to fill this space with the proper things. People often try to fill this void with material things, like money, in the hope that it will give them happiness. But this is wrong thinking. If there is spiritual belief, there will be an internal satisfaction, and this will give lasting happiness. We humans are more than animals. We have a spiritual component. We look for meaning and purpose that lies beyond ourselves. So how did the people of China try to fill that spiritual emptiness in the past? What was the first religion of China? Many believe it was Buddhism. The founder of Buddhism was Siddhartha Gautama, a royal prince of India in the 5th century BCE who gave up his earthly position in order to find enlightenment. The legend tells us that he found a path through meditation that finally led him to completeness as he sat beneath a papal tree. He became the Buddha, the Awakened One. Over the centuries, Buddhism spread from India to other countries throughout Asia, and eventually the entire world but it did not enter China until the year 67 BC. The timeline takes us back more than 2,000 years. But Buddhism did not originate in China we must look further back in time to the 5th and 6th centuries BCE to find a prominent religion that had its origin in China. Taoism is a polytheistic religion that worships many gods. There are gods and goddesses of mercy, money, fertility, war, and a multitude of other deities. This belief in many gods became accepted through the philosophical writings of Lao Tzu and his successor Zhuangzi. But the religion did not flourish until around the first century of the Common Era, when the teachings were codified. There was another historian and philosopher whose teachings became popular much earlier. Confucius was born in 551 BC. To much of the Western world, Confucius is little more than the author of clever sayings that fit inside fortune cookies. But his wisdom and scholarly work are very important to us in our search for the first religion of China. He believed in humanism and ethical behavior but he never intended to start a religion. In his work, he strove to breathe meaning into the rituals passed down from ancient times, the religion that already existed. Confucius compiled what we now know as the Chinese classics, five books which recount the earliest history of China, its emperors, its poetry and music, 
an understanding of the will of the God of the universe, and the moral basis for the royal regulations and religious ceremonies. The works of Confucius show us that the first religion of China goes back to the origin of Chinese civilization itself, all the way back to the Yellow Emperor Huangdi, who built an altar to the supreme god Shangdi around 2500 BCE, more than 4,500 years ago. The Tiantan complex was built just 600 years ago, but it was built to re-establish the worship of Shangdi precisely as it was meant to be practiced. Millennia of disregard had corrupted the rituals, the music, and the intent of the border sacrifices and other ceremonies. So the third emperor of the Ming dynasty, known as the Happiness Emperor Yang Lu, ordered the construction of the Forbidden City and the Temple of Heaven complex. He then commanded the restoration of the rituals. But how can we know that his scholars got it right? Fortunately, we have three ancient sources that confirm the accuracy. The first is the classics written by Confucius, as we have already discussed. The Shu Jin, Book of History, is filled with information about the worship. The second source is the lifetime work of China's greatest historian, Sima Chen. In 105 BCE, he took over his father's work of compiling an extensive history of China's past, including the religious practices. It was a lifetime undertaking, and he referenced many written texts that are no longer existing today. The third source is the Oracle Bones. These historic records are actually written on turtle shells and were uncovered by archaeological digs in Henan province. These are among the earliest examples of Chinese script, written during the latter Shang dynasty, approximately 3,700 years ago. In the year 2000, the government of China concluded a five-year project on the chronology of early Chinese history. Experts in nine disciplines of scientific research concluded that the ancient written histories are indeed reliable. The 1995 study had linguists who were experts at analyzing ancient Chinese writing. They also had uh, uh, physicists who did carbon-14 dating and verified the age of a lot of the uh, materials that they were uncovering through archaeology. The China Project was also able to verify the fact that Emperor Shun in 2200 BC offered sacrifice to Shangdi. And this was verified by the astronomers because they showed that only an eyewitness could have known uh, the astronomical events that were taking place and that were recorded in that very same history. The first religion of China was monotheistic. The people venerated their ancestors and they believed in spirit beings as well. But all of these were subservient to Shangdi, the one supreme creator god of the heavens and earth and all life. The long written history of China is trustworthy, and it proves that the first religion of China was not what we see today. It's amazing that every god in China can be traced back to a point in time when that god began to be worshipped. Only one god in Chinese history doesn't have a beginning, and that's Shangdi. He always existed, he was always there, and the Chinese always worshipped him as a supreme god who controlled everything. The concept of one supreme god is not unique to China. It is found in cultures and religions around the globe. Most Native American tribes believe in one creator God. The Cherokee refer to him as the maker of all things. And 
Kaviv Tiahi, meaning the one who lives above. He is called by many names, but to most Native Americans, he is the Great Spirit, or Great Mystery. To the indigenous Himba people of Namibia in Africa, the supreme god is Makuru. To the Kalash people of Pakistan, he is Yama Raja, meaning Father Heaven. There is one creator god in the Baha'i faith, the Sikh religion, and the ancient Zoroastrian belief. And of course, the supreme creator god is most widely known through the global religions of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Billions of people on our planet, more than 90% of all people groups, hold to this belief. But how is it that this concept came to be universally held? People worship God because innately we sense within us that there is a supreme being who is greater than us and over us, namely God, who made the universe and life itself with intelligent design and wants us to worship Him. Could it be that this innate sense is put within us by the supreme God who wants to be known? If we accept the idea that there is one Creator God, then it is not unreasonable to believe that this God has revealed Himself in various ways, having interacted with us through certain events. We also find that all these cultures have common myths or common stories or legends about a creation, about a flood, and many of them also have stories about a time of confusion of languages from which they branched out into all the world. The imperial sacrifice at Tiantan contains references to the creation of the world and of people by Shangdi. According to the Ming statutes, the first prayer of the great sacrifice translates as follows. Of old, in the beginning, there was great chaos without form and dark. The five elements had not begun to revolve, nor the sun and the moon to shine. In the midst, therefore, there existed neither form nor sound. Thou, O spiritual sovereign, camest forth in thy presidency, and first didst divide the grosser parts from the pure. Thou madest heaven, thou madest earth, thou madest man. All things with the reproducing power got their being. This prayer at the sacrifice ceremony is remarkable in its similarity to the Genesis account of creation in the scriptures of Judaism and Christianity. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. The scriptures proceed to tell how God created all living things, including the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, and how sin entered the world when they disobeyed God's instruction. According to the scriptures, people increased upon the earth, but so did their wickedness because of the sin in their hearts. Finally, God decided to punish mankind with a great flood, sparing just one righteous man and his family. His name was Noah. But can we take this story seriously? In the early 1970s, we made a film on the Genesis Flood and Noah's Ark uh, just to see if there was credible evidence for the historicity of that biblical story. Uh, did a great deal of research, uh, actually made a trip to Mount Ararat, and then following that made uh, some interviews with people who had actually seen the Ark on Mount Ararat at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, made the film with the strong conviction that there was plenty of evidence for its historicity and its believability. Flood stories are also found throughout the world, though details often vary from culture to culture. From the myths of ancient Greece to the East African Maasai tribe, from the native Eskimos of the far north to Mexico's Huichol people. 
all have a story of a global flood in which animals and a small number of people were saved in a boat. And this is just a taste of the hundreds of flood stories around the planet. But the Epic of Gilgamesh is the earliest recorded version with the oldest cuneiform tablets coming from the third millennia BC. Though the details are clearly mythologized to reflect a belief in many gods, the major points of a global flood and a righteous man building a boat that carries people and animals and eventually lands on a high mountain all fit the biblical narrative and point to an actual catastrophic event. In 1974, coming down off of the mountain, and, um, I was really struck with the idea that from this very mountain all the peoples of the earth came. And as they scattered out over the earth, they would carry with them the story of the flood and of the ark and of the God who caused the flood and of the sacrifices that Noah made to him. The people of China also have flood stories that fit the Bible's criteria. The Lolo people in southwestern China and the Jino people of southern Yunnan have such tales. And the Lisu people of northwest Yunnan even add that the descendants of those who landed their boat on top of the mountain traveled different directions and became the ancestors of different races that populate the earth today. The Human Genome Project came up with an interesting finding where they say that every human being alive today can be traced back to six or eight people that lived on the face of the earth. And that is very interesting because we do find a uh, history recorded that tells us about a great flood, a man named Noah, and that after that flood, the whole world dispersed from one place. And this would explain why we find monotheistic beliefs all around the world, a belief in a creator sky god, and especially explains why the Chinese from the very beginning of their history would have worshipped that one true god by the name of Shangdi. San. Shen was the ancestor of the Jewish people. He was also the ancestor of the Chinese race because Shen and his family tribe migrated to the east. So I believe that all the Chinese people receive excellent teachings from Shen. And we can clearly see from evidences in our culture our written characters and legends that are similar to the stories in Genesis, that we can be certain God loves the Chinese people very much. The Bible next describes the source of all languages. According to the 10th chapter of Genesis, the people built a tower high into the sky in order to elevate themselves to the level of God. This tower became known as the Tower of Babel because God, seeing what evil people could accomplish when unified, chose to confuse their one language into many. The Malwiya Minaret of the Muslim faith stands beside the great mosque of Samara in Iraq as a remembrance of the spiral towers of ancient Mesopotamia. This idea of reaching to the heavens still exists today skyscrapers reach higher and higher into the sky to elevate the wisdom of man. But China's religious pursuits have been trying to reach the heavens since the ancient past, from elevated pagodas that mimic the Tower of Babel to the elevated altars such as we find at Tiantan. Can it be that all of these stories exist because they point back to the original events recorded in Genesis? then we would expect to find differences in details of the stories amongst various cultures. But the broader points would be held in common. From the Bible, Solomon says that human beings have eternity in their hearts. This can be seen in all the cultures of the world. Each story each similarity in belief, each cultural marker arising from a divinely ordained event, 
is a universal witness to the existence and character of God. Among the Chinese, especially during the ceremonies worshiping Shangdi, we can see that the Chinese people needed to seek God. The original religion of China worshipped one supreme and sovereign god named Shangdi. This monotheistic belief agrees with the beliefs of many ancient people groups, but especially those holding religions that regard the first five books of the Bible, those written by Moses, as being divinely inspired. We are able to establish without a doubt that the God revealed in the Bible and by Moses in the Old Testament is the same God that the Chinese worship by the name Shangdi. How do we know this? Because they both share the exact same attributes that only the one true God could have. We only know about God if He reveals Himself to us. And in the Hebrew Scriptures, God has revealed a number of wonderful attributes or characteristics of Himself such as the fact that God is kadosh, or holy. He's tzaddik, or righteous. Uh, he is all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present. Uh, he is just. Uh, he is loving, and kind, and compassionate. Uh, slow to anger, and abounding in chesed, or loving-kindness, or loyal love to his people. Shangdi means God on high, or the Supreme God, which reflects the fact that all his characteristics are present to the utmost degree, making him worthy of reverence from all people throughout all history. The earliest recorded sacrifices to Shangdi were conducted by the Emperor Shun in 2250 BC. Significantly, this was around the same time that God was revealing himself to the patriarch of the Hebrew race, Abraham. The God of the Bible is sovereign. Shangdi is sovereign. The God in the Bible is omnipotent and all-wise and all-knowing. Shangdi is all-powerful, omnipotent, all-wise, all-knowing. And we know this about Shangdi because all his attributes have been recorded in the great history books of China. The Chinese classics, especially the Shi Jing, Book of Poetry, and the Shu Jing, Book of History, declare Shangdi's supernatural attributes of eternality, sovereignty, all knowledge, and all power, just as we find in the Hebrew Tanakh and the Holy Bible of Christianity. The classic of poetry tells us, Mysteriously, Almighty Heaven is able to strengthen anything. O oh, Almighty Shangdi, you come to us in your majesty. You discern all that is happening for the peace of the people. Only the mandate of heaven is absolute and eternal, majestic and infinite. Likewise, the classic of history describes Shangdi's moral attributes and expectations. Pride brings loss. Humility brings rewards. This is the way of heaven. Heaven loves the people. The ruler should honor heaven. These characteristics of Shangdi are the same attributes of the Almighty God described in the Bible. In the names that God uses to reveal himself to us, we can see that he is love, that everything belongs to him, and he provides all our needs. He is also light, he shines in darkness. God is great and to be feared, and He knows everything and is everywhere. 
is just and will be the final judge of all things. The idea of accountability to the God who created us goes hand in hand with the Creator's attributes. If it were possible that we just happened without creative design by a supreme being, then we would not be accountable to anyone or anything. But creation itself points to the existence of God. Romans 1.20 For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. If we were created by a supreme being with supreme characteristics, then we were created with a purpose. The Bible tells us that this purpose is to have a relationship with our Creator, to bring Him the glory He deserves. And it stands to reason that God will be the ultimate judge of how we fulfilled this purpose or ignored it. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Hebrews 9.27 Shangdi was often called heaven or great heaven, but the reference was always to the supreme creator who rules the heavens and the earth, not to the creation itself. A parable is told in the Holy Bible about a son who took his inheritance and wasted it. When he returned to his father to ask forgiveness, he confessed, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. In the same manner, emperors of the Ming and Qing dynasties understood that the altar of heaven complex and the prayers to heaven were prayers to its creator and sustainer. Shangdi was recognized in ancient China as the supreme judge just as the God of the Bible is recognized as the Supreme Judge. The power and authority of the Chinese emperors was always dependent upon the favor of Shangdi. The divine authority to be emperor was called heaven's mandate. The mandate of heaven could be withdrawn or given to another if the emperor mistreated his subjects and dishonored Shangdi. Heaven's mandate was, therefore, subject to Shangdi's judgment. The holy scriptures of Judaism and Christianity also confirm heaven's mandate. O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Romans 13 verse 1 China's emperors were accountable to Shangdi. In heaven's inspection of men below, he considers their righteousness. He bestows on them length of years or otherwise. Heaven does not cut short men's lives. They cut short their lives themselves. Classic of History, Book of Shang. As in the past, China's people today and all people on earth are accountable to the supreme holy God of heaven. Each of us will stand before his judgment seat. Will we receive his mercy and blessings or his punishment.